Welcome back, everybody, for another deep dive. This time, we're going to be looking into something really fascinating, the world's first biological computer. Yeah. You guys sent in an article about it from the journals mm -hmm. uh, called World's First Biological Computer Unveiled. Cortical Labs CL1 combines human brain cells with silicon. And honestly, even I was kind of blown away by this when I first saw it. Yeah, it's really uh, pushing the boundaries of what we thought was possible. You know, right. we're really talking about like merging living human brain cells with traditional silicon hardware here. It's pretty crazy. Okay, I have to admit, when I first saw this, I was like, this is science fiction. Right. But it's real. It is. And it's called the CL1. Yes. And it's developed by a company called Cortical Labs. That's right. They're calling the technology behind it Synthetic Biological Intelligence, or SBI for short. Can you break that down for us? Sure. What exactly is SBI? So SBI is basically a completely revolutionary approach to computing. It harnesses the inherent learning and adaptation capabilities of living neurons to process information. Okay. So imagine combining the computational power of silicon with the complexity and adaptability of biological systems. So instead of lines of code and algorithms, we're talking about actual living neurons. Yes. Doing the thinking. Doing the thinking, exactly. That's pretty wild. It is. And what's so fascinating about this is that SBI isn't just mimicking the structure of the brain. You know, right. It's utilizing the actual function of living neurons. So it's not just mimicking the brain structure. It's like having a mini brain. Exactly. Working as part of a computer system. A mini brain on a chip. Yep. That's crazy. And because it's using actual biological processes, it learns and adapts in ways that traditional AI just simply can't. The article mentions they actually got these neurons to play the video game Pong. Yes. How do you even begin to teach a cluster of brain cells a video game? It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So essentially what they did was they created a simplified virtual environment that represented the game Pong. Okay. And the neurons received electrical signals corresponding to the position of the ball and the player's paddle. Gotcha. And then depending on the neuron's activity, they sent signals back to control the paddle's movement. So the neurons are receiving input about the game and then making decisions based on that input. Exactly. That's incredible. But I have to ask... Why go to all this trouble? I mean, we already have really powerful computers. Right, right. But the CL1 and SBI in general offer some very specific advantages. Remember, traditional AI is limited by its programming and the data it's trained on. Right. Biological systems, on the other hand, have evolved over millions of years to learn and adapt to incredibly complex environments. So it's more than just processing power. It's yeah. about a different kind of intelligence. Exactly. One that is inherently more adaptable and potentially much more efficient. Exactly. Yeah. Think about it. Biological processes can perform complex computations with very minimal energy. Your brain uses less power than a light bulb. Yeah. Yet it can do some pretty amazing things. Wild. Traditional computers with their silicon chips and complex circuitry require huge amounts of energy. So the CL1 kind of taps into the inherent efficiency of biological systems. So this could revolutionize our approach to computing. Potentially. Making yeah. it more sustainable and efficient. For sure. And what's even more remarkable is that the CL1 doesn't even need an external computer to function. Oh, wow. It's a self-contained unit. That is really impressive. But I'm sure our listeners are wondering, how realistic is it for someone like them to actually work with this technology? Right. It sounds super cutting edge. Right. And that's where things get really interesting. So Cortical Labs has designed the CL1 with accessibility in mind. Okay. So you can actually purchase the hardware. Oh, wow. Or you can access it remotely through their cloud-based platform. Oh, cool. Called Cortical Cloud. So it's not just locked away in some high security lab. Not at all. And this opens up a ton of possibilities for smaller research teams, startups, even individual innovators to get their hands on this groundbreaking technology. That's exciting. So when can people start experimenting with this? Well, the official launch was March 2nd of this year. Okay. And Cortical Labs is planning on making the CL1 commercially available in the second half of 2025. So it's right around the corner. So we're not just talking about a futuristic concept. This is something that could be in people's labs or on their desks very soon. Very soon. That's so cool. It really is incredible to think that we're on the verge of a whole new era of computing, one where machines think more like us. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> and that raises some really interesting questions, doesn't it? It does. Like, if we can create computers that learn and adapt, like living organisms, you know? Right. What does that say about our own understanding of intelligence? 
Yeah, it makes you wonder if we've been thinking about intelligence too narrowly, too focused on like our own human way of doing things. Maybe this opens up a whole new way of looking at how intelligence can manifest itself in the world. Exactly. It challenges our assumptions about what it means to be intelligent, you know? Yeah. And it also raises some pretty profound questions about the relationship between humans and technology. Right. Like if the lines between biological and artificial intelligence become blurred, where does that leave us? That's a big one. It makes you think about like our place in the world and how we define ourselves. Hmm. If machines can learn and solve problems like we can, even play games like Pong, does that change how we view our own capabilities? It certainly puts things into perspective. Yeah. And it pushes us to consider the potential impact on society as a whole. Right. How will we adapt to a world where biological computers become commonplace? What kind of jobs will they create? What kind of challenges will they present? That's a lot to unpack. It sounds like we're stepping into uncharted territory here, <laughs> both technologically and philosophically. We are. And that's why it's so crucial to have these conversations now, as this technology is still in its early stages. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be thinking about the ethical implications, the societal impact, and the potential risks, as well as the rewards. Speaking of risks, are there any downsides or potential dangers that we should be considering? Of course, with any new technology, especially one as powerful as this, there are always potential downsides. Right. We need to be mindful of the possibility of unintended consequences. For example, if biological computers become highly sophisticated, how do we ensure they're used responsibly? How do we prevent them from being used for harmful purposes? It's like opening Pandora's box. Once you unleash this kind of power, you can't always predict how it will be used. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to have really open and honest discussions about the potential risks and challenges associated with this technology. We need to approach it with caution and foresight, mm -hmm. while also embracing the incredible possibilities that it offers. So it's about finding a balance between progress and responsibility. Yeah. Not letting our excitement about the potential blind us to the potential dangers. Precisely. It's about being proactive and thoughtful in shaping the future that we want to see. A future where biological computers are used to benefit humanity, not harm it. Well said. So as we enter this new era of biocomputing, what can our listeners do to stay informed and engaged in this rapidly evolving landscape? Well, staying informed is key. Keep an eye on publications like the journals, which is doing a good job of covering these advancements in an accessible way. Definitely. And I'm sure there will be countless articles, forums, and discussions happening online. Oh, absolutely. It's going to be a hot topic for sure. Absolutely. And I encourage everyone to engage in those discussions, to ask questions, to voice their concerns. The more we talk about this, the better equipped we'll be to navigate the challenges and really harness the potential of this technology. It sounds like education and open dialogue are going to be essential as we move forward. We need to make sure everyone understands the implications of this technology, not just scientists and tech experts. I agree. This isn't just a niche topic anymore. It's something that could potentially impact everyone's lives. So we've covered the potential benefits, the challenges, the need for responsible development. But I'm curious, stepping back for a moment, what does the development of the CL1 tell us about the direction technology is heading in? Well, I think it really points toward a future where the lines between biology and technology become increasingly blurred. We're already seeing this in fields like bioengineering and genetic modification. And the CL1 takes it a step further. So we're moving away from seeing technology as something separate from nature and toward a more integrated approach where biology and technology work together. Exactly. We're beginning to understand that we can leverage the power of biological systems to create technologies that are more efficient, more sustainable, and even more intelligent. Like we're learning from nature's own design principles and applying them to our technological creations. That's a great way to put it. We're essentially entering a new era of bioconvergence. And the CL1 is just the beginning. And this convergence has the potential to revolutionize countless industries, right? From healthcare and pharmaceuticals to robotics and manufacturing, even to how we understand and treat diseases. Absolutely. The possibilities are truly vast. Imagine bioengineered prosthetics that seamlessly integrate with the human body, personalized medicine tailored to our individual DNA, Robots that can learn and adapt like living creatures. It sounds like science fiction, but it's becoming reality right before our eyes. And that's what makes it so exciting. We're literally rewriting the rules of what's possible with technology. It's almost overwhelming to think about the potential impact. So to summarize everything we've discussed so far, 
The CL1, this biological computer powered by human brain cells, is a major art game changer. It's not just a cool new gadget, it's a sign of a much larger shift happening in the way we approach technology. Yeah, it's a shift towards a more integrated, biocentric approach that has the potential to revolutionize countless industries and aspects of our lives. And while there are definitely some big questions to consider as this technology develops, the possibilities are truly mind-blowing. It's a future full of unknowns, but one thing is for sure, it's gonna be an incredible ride. Before we wrap up this deep dive, I have to ask, what's the one big takeaway you want our listeners to walk away with today? That's a great question. Um, I think the most important thing to remember is that the development of the CL1, it's not just a technological breakthrough. Right. It's a philosophical one, you know? It really challenges our understanding of intelligence, consciousness, the very nature of life itself, really. And it forces us to confront some pretty huge questions about the role of technology in our lives and like the future of humanity. Exactly. So as we marvel at the incredible possibilities of this technology, let's not forget to engage in these crucial conversations. Yeah. And ensure that we're shaping the future that we want to see. That's a great point. Okay, well, on that note, we're just about out of time for today's deep dive. But before we sign off, I have one final question for you. If biological computers become widespread, how might this change our understanding of intelligence, consciousness, and the relationship between humans and technology? Ah, the million dollar question. If machines can truly think and learn like humans, does that mean they're also capable of experiencing consciousness? And if so, what ethical responsibilities do we have towards these machines? It's mind boggling, isn't it? It's almost like we're blurring the lines between creator and creation. We've always thought of intelligence and consciousness as distinctly human traits, but what happens when we start replicating those traits in machines? It definitely challenges our preconceived notions. It forces us to re-examine our definition of life and intelligence and to consider the potential implications of creating machines that could one day surpass our own cognitive abilities. It's both exciting and a little unsettling, isn't it? Like we're standing at the precipice of something truly revolutionary, but we're not quite sure what lies on the other side. That's the beauty of scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. It often leads us to more questions than answers. Yeah. But those questions are what drive us to explore, to learn, and to push the boundaries of human knowledge. So what you're saying is that this isn't just about the technology itself. It's about the philosophical and ethical questions it raises. It's about expanding our understanding of what's possible and what it means to be human in an increasingly technological world. Precisely. The development of the CL1 is just the beginning. It's a glimpse into a future where biology and technology merge seamlessly and where the very definition of intelligence is constantly evolving. It's a future full of possibilities, both wondrous and challenging. It's a future that we're all shaping together, whether we realize it or not. And that's why it's so important to engage in these conversations, to be informed, and to be thoughtful about the choices we make as we navigate this uncharted territory. Well said. On that note, we've reached the end of our deep dive into the world of biological computers. We've covered a lot of ground today. From the technical details of the CL1 to the broader philosophical implications of this groundbreaking technology, we've explored the potential benefits and the potential challenges, and we've hopefully sparked some thought-provoking questions along the way. The future of biocomputing is still unfolding, but one thing is certain. It's going to be a fascinating journey. Indeed. And we encourage you, our listeners, to continue exploring this topic, to stay curious, and to engage in the ongoing conversations that are shaping the future of this incredible technology. Because ultimately, the future is what we make it. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the world of biological computers. We'll catch you